the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story, and this is My Backstory with Josh Boyer. Boom, and we're live. Well, we're not live. I mean, we're recording now, though. So the, re- the recording is the recording is ha- has taken life. That's right. So here we are, man. And um, how do you pronounce the city here? Le- Lehigh. Le- Lehigh. Yeah. We're in Lehigh, Utah, with Sean Burroughs. Sean Go Boom on Instagram. And um, I actually met Sean when I was out here the last time, and what was it last month? Maybe the month before. Was that? it? It was during the. Uh, hunt and outdoor conservation expo uh that's why we we're hanging out downtown right with the guys from rhino metals and adam from uh, star spangled sups yeah um i don't know if you were attending that so yeah i no, was i was er- attending it, early but... february so yeah okay, a couple yeah. months ago so i was out here i met sean and his wife and um and i was like man we gotta do a podcast together let's do it so i'm back out here in the salt lake city area and um, I want Sean to share his story with you. And as I explained to him, and I've explained to other guests that have come on the um, on the podcast, I don't do much research. I don't like I don't like to research the people that I'm interviewing because I feel like it takes away from the actual interview itself. Because I'm getting to know you, just like the people who are listening to this podcast are going to get to know you through the through the podcast. So it's kind of I feel like it's more of an organic uh, type of conversation. Um, so it'll be mostly you talking and sharing your story, brother. So. You can share as much as you want, your upbringing, where you're from, um, what you're up to now, where you see yourself going in the future, blase, blase. And uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, take it away, brother. Uh, your time to shine. Well, w- when we were talking about doing this, the whole story thing's fascinating to me because, uh, I mean, I tell stories for a living. I, I, uh, I'm in the marketing space and yeah. I help a lot of uh, brands, individuals, um tell a story that will uh lead to some sort of action right yeah that usually involves a a purchase or a (laughs) yeah and and uh so i'm fascinated with the concept of humans fascination with storytelling right uh you could be walking down the street bird shits on your head and uh you know different people looking at life through different paradigms will will uh draw varying degrees of uh um conclusions about it you know people that are in some headspace will think that you know the universe wants them to learn a lesson other people say really are you kidding me what are the odds and and everything in between a lotto ticket it's lucky right exactly (laughs) i I mean but i mean as humans we're wired to make stories out of everything you know like what's the meaning of that like or this is not my lucky day yeah. of course it happened on today because all these other things just happened or right. what are the odds i was having such a good day and and it, you know it can just mean something yeah. i mean for me it just pissed me off right uh, i do like stories but i don't try to <laughs> extract meaning from where <laughs> where it may or may not be right all right or I, and maybe my eyes just aren't open maybe i'm not woke enough but how should i woke absolutely <laughs> feel the burn <laughs> no I, I mean so I, I can tell all sorts of stories so if, I, if i'm talking in the marketing space like i meet with people with all sorts of different backgrounds i mean i've been an entrepreneur i own several businesses and but you know my day-to-day to take me through feast and famine whether i'm starting something or selling something uh, on the entrepreneurial side it's uh, the wife and kids appreciate a little bit of regularity you know yeah for sure food and shelter and <laughs> basic necessities stuff that men could willingly for intervals of time go without <laughs> right women and children seem to prefer on a consistent basis right funny enough and 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 so but i i get to meet with uh, so many different types of clients and you know as long as they're honest and have something relatively good uh to, to bring to the mark to bring to their marketplace you know uh, i i like to work with clients i like to work with if if something's boring and we're gonna have a hard time coming up with a story to sell it <laughs> you know i'll pass but i mean 
I meet all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life all over the world. Right. And, uh, you know, the story they get about me will be uh, in-depth stuff, but around the context of how I can be of use to them, right? So right. Um, the context in which we met, I, I mean, we, we talk more about my uh, um, sponsored competitive shooter life. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, frankly, that's, that's where I put a lot of uh, attention and energy because it's so much fun. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, and so you're, I'm, I'm probably not going to talk much about marketing on here. I, <laughs> so, I, I mean, when, when you said, let's do a podcast and do my, my backstory, like, gosh, I could paint it all sorts of ways, depending on how I want someone to be viewed. And so it's, it's interesting to have this, uh, open canvas of, uh, zero context. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I mean, it's your, uh, it's how, like you said, man, it's your, whatever way you want to, whatever you want to share, how you want to share it completely up to you. You know, like your, like I said, your upbringing, like how you got well, into competitive shooting. I'll, 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 uh, I'll start with a, a question then. Like, yeah. why'd you decide to do a, an interview with me? What, what made you want to bring it up? I think, um, when I look at like, uh, from a, like a marketing standpoint, if you will, and there's plenty of people that I could, I can go to all my friends and I can like say, Hey, uh, you know, let's do podcasts together. But I was like, is that really going to be an interesting? What kind of, what kind of audience are you going to get from that? <clears throat> um, and so when I look for people that I think are fascinating, that I think are doing things like, cause if you look at like a competitive shooter, like yourself, that takes a shit ton of practice, a shit ton of discipline and a lot of mindset. And when I started, um, when I started the podcast, I started it because of like, I wanted to share my mindset and like, I wanted to talk to other people that utilize like a positive winning mindset to, to accomplish amazing things. So a little bit of, I don't know if you know any about my story or like kind of how I started this whole thing. So I'll share it if you haven't. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we talked a, a, a little bit. Right. Um, so like I did my last, uh, my last, I had, I've had six back surgeries and, um, the last back surgery I had, um, I did it without any pain pills. I was like, you know, I'm just gonna do this sans pain pills um was a huge undertaking uh, i had been addicted to like a lot of different like pain pills before that with the previous five surgeries and quit all that cold turkey so I'm, I'm done i'm just not doing it anymore and everyone thought i was crazy my family my like everyone was like oh you're nuts like you're you're gonna you could die from like quitting everything i was like no it's my mind is ready to do it like, let's just quit and be done and so i did and it sucked but then when I had this next, when I knew I was having another surgery, I was kind of scared, like, oh shit, I'm going to go down that same road of like addiction and blah, blah, blah. And, but I had surrounded myself luckily with a lot of like positive thinking, powerful individuals. And, um, I did, was not around the kind of people when I was down that, that old road before. Okay. So on this new journey, I was like, no, I'll be okay. Cause I have like a lot of positive influences in my life. And then, uh, I wanted to share that story. I wanted to share my story of like, mindset and like how it's so important anything you do in life whether it be getting off of drugs whether it be uh being a competitive shooter whether it be getting through some of the most rigorous military training in the world um whatever it may be whatever your vocation is in life um and so i was like yeah i'll start the podcast so to answer your question i think what you do for a living uh being a competitive shooter is like what, what do you think the percentages of people in the world that can do what you do well, probably, probably um, pretty low. <laughs> I, I usually spend uh, my time at least a couple weekends a month through the, the majority of the year around the small percentage of people in the world that do what I do. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> there. Uh, um, ha have I have I gone out of my way to um, find the the quotient of that out of seven billion? Nah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's, it's probably pretty pretty small though if you like think about it cuz I, I don't think like I did a shooting class this last weekend with a guy um that came down from uh, North Carolina and there was five of us uh five or six of us in the class and you know I, I went there thinking like I'm an okay shooter. I'm not like I'm definitely not good. I'm I'm just okay, you know, cuz I it's not it's a perishable skill. You know, it's not something that like Oh, well, it's yeah, something yeah. that you you need to develop and then maintain, right? And then if you want to progress, uh, it's it's in uh, above and beyond and in addition to the maintenance, right? So, well, let, let's start there because I mean, so 
I mean, I grew up in Alaska, being around guns, being taught that guns don't kill people, people kill people, all mm -hmm. that. It yeah. was just part of my life. Um, my dad worked for the, the U.S. Geological Survey and uh, was out in the middle of nowhere measuring streams and stuff. Uh, wow. <laughs> and he just had a Colt Python on his hip, right? Yeah. It's just, it, it was just normal. Yeah. Um, he wasn't walking around with it on his hip uh at home i i grew up in uh as suburban and urban of a setting as one possibly could living in alaska right, right. I, i'm a city boy as one could possibly be and still be from alaska but um even within that context you know all my friends went hunting with their dads and uh, nobody thought guns were bad that i was aware of right, right. my friends my parents their friends, family members, cousins, right? Um, at least it wasn't openly expressed. And so it, it's so, it was so foreign to me, you know, to see or run into any anti gun sentiment on TV or now on the internet. I, I just, it's taken me a long time to uh, be, I guess, empathetic to that view in order to have uh, um, open conversations, yeah. open, friendly conversations about it. Um, but you know, that to get out of the state, I, uh, I, I wanted to be a professional drummer. That's all I did. You know, these long winters, you know, the, I watched my friends go down on one of two, one of two paths. They, they had something to do, a hobby, a sport, uh, a pastime of some kind when they weren't doing school, um, or they got into partying. Yeah. There were some that did both, but the ones that didn't have that um hobby those long dark winters turned into some long dark moments later in their lives oh for sure um alcoholism addiction suicide is pretty high in the the dark far north right. so amongst uh teens adults um i just wanted to get out of there i love playing drums more than anything in the world and uh toured with a couple bands came down to the lower 48 as we call it and uh we I realized quickly that uh, uh, the one thing I wanted to do more than anything else in the world was no longer fun, and I hated it the second I had to do that to eat and pay rent. <laughs> so the whole, uh, I don't even know who originally said it, uh, the idea of uh, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life, that that to me has has never held true. Like I, I don't get it. Um, there are things that I love to do and I will do, regardless of a paycheck like it is intrinsically rewarding right and then there are things that i do well and i do it for a living but if there was no longer a need to generate income i wouldn't do it anymore or right. it would be uh, uh my, my involvement in such activities would be greatly reduced yeah okay so um life went on uh you know i went to college got married I was in an apartment, uh, uh, moved here to Salt Lake eventually. Um, from where? Like straight from Alaska to here? No, I, uh, um, I, I toured around. I uh, um, lived various places. I, I mean, I was a working touring musician straight out of high school. Right. Um, it got me out of the state. Right. Um, I explored a lot of different things. Um, right. Listing that will eat up any interesting time left in your podcast <laughs> but you know I, I might touch on some of it but the the whole concept of uh you know leaving that like it was hard to stop playing drums oh for sure um I, I, the short seek short version of the sequence of events is uh my band I, I joined a band and we were doing creative stuff i was no longer a hired gun but i was in a, a band with original content and we uh put out a couple of CDs, uh, you know, self-published, which in the late nineties, putting out CDs and CD burners were new, right? Like it, it was a big deal. Most people had a demo tape. So we went above and beyond just to stand out. We were talking to a couple of major labels, um, back when the music industry was still, uh, um, profitable, right? Right. Pre Napster. Yep. And, uh, we, <laughs> uh, it, it just started falling apart, you know, just, once we, we'd worked so hard to get to the starting point 
to try to do this at a at a, at a big scale yeah and uh just you know bass players taking mental health days and <laughs> singers um deciding they wanted to sing about completely different things that changed the voice and stance of the entire band and just you know we <laughs> We'd all been friends for so long and decided to get together and do this. And then all of a sudden it just didn't work. You know, we, we'd been out in the, the world a little bit of time and we would experience some things and well, geez, maybe, maybe I think differently. Right. And, uh, and here am I just watching all this fall apart. Um, what was the genre of the band? Uh, we, well, if you ask a musician, a musician doesn't want to be uh, nailed down by a label. So oh. we we would joke and say we were Alaskan oi core. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it was all turn a pop. Oh, wait, I like oh. I like late nineties all turn a pop. Yeah. We we had we had some unique sounding songs, but uh, one of the things we were doing that no one else was doing at the time because it was in the midst of all the the ska stuff. Even non ska bands had horns and stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, we we had a keyboard player and we're playing 80s synth stuff and you know late 90s it, it, you know the idea of something being so 80s was, was still very much alive because it was the 90s yeah. we just got out of the 80s yeah. <laughs> and um, some people you know some people liked it other people didn't so you know a decade later when all the 80s stuff really hit again those sounds like <laughs> yeah, we really did have something yeah. we were behind yet we were ahead it's weird now right like you listen to music uh, the 60s sounded like the 60s 70s 80s 90s now everything's just kind of you know uh, music labels aren't in charge of everything anymore you right. can self-publish you can you can create whatever you want and get it out in front of as many people as you want if you're willing to put in the work and yep. I, I i like that idea but uh but at the time you know yeah, everyone's still being told what to like and listen to through MTV and mainstream media. The internet was a novelty. You couldn't really download music. You could I remember there was this, what was it called? Real player. Yeah. Real yeah, player. You, you could like compress 30 seconds of your music. Yep. And it was, it, I mean, it would sound like a cassette tape that had been a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. It was really fuzzy and uh, just low, low quality stuff. Right. Yeah. And, um, you think iTunes kind of ruined the the music industry? Napster did. Napster, LimeWire, and Napster. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, iTunes was the the answer to that, right? Right. Something to make uh, record labels happy, but record labels don't have the control anymore. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, back in the nineties, uh, you, you you don't have gold and platinum selling artists anymore. You watch yeah. the VMAs back then, like, oh, now platinum, triple platinum, quadruple platinum. Like, you, that didn't, that doesn't exist anymore. We have big name artists, but, you know, back then, your average artist, you, you think about what a CD cost. You know, you, you, you could buy a single. Yeah, 15 yeah. bucks. Yeah. Your average major label artist, whether it was a band or a solo, uh, made 25 cents off of every CD sold. Are you serious? So they sell a million records, a band of four people. Um, profited quarter million dollars split that four ways or whatever right wow so i didn't realize that that's crazy so you know you, they're getting all the attention and and flattery but they're not the ones making the real money so artists would uh, often make most of their real profits off of merchandising right t-shirts stickers whatever and uh so um it's better now that it's spread out, but you you have to you have to hustle. You have to be an entrepreneur in order to be a, a musician now. Yeah. And Spotify's done a lot of damage. Spotify and uh, Pandora, as far as how much an artist makes, they 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 make all that money off of uh, ad revenue, but labels only get pennies for every time a song's played. Right. And how much that trickles down to the artist? I mean, I don't know if it's in the same proportion of. 25 cents for every 15 dollars well, but i say it was like 10 my cousin told me because he uh his band like they, when they get downloaded or whatever he, he makes a, a percentage or something like that but it's in the it's definitely in the cent range you know it's not it's definitely not dollars you know you, you can't you can't raise a, a family <laughs> no there's no way that's i mean he actually kind of the same um 
similar story to yours, like where he was in a band, they were touring all over the country. Um, it was like a, uh, again, I, if I asked him what the genre was, I don't even know what he would say. I mean, maybe, uh, probably was an Alaskan oikor. It definitely was not. Nah. Like maybe like SoCal reggae or something. You know? <laughs> right. Like, like very sublime ish, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and, they had a, a huge following, you know, they were doing really well. Uh, they j- actually just played at the one love festival and stuff. But, um, when I was talking to him about it, I didn't realize like how many, how many like, uh, moving parts there were in the band, you know, with all the different personalities from the singer, the drummer and this and that. Oh, jeez, like, It's way easier being married. Oh, for sure. And it, I, he, I got <laughs> a wife and four kids and it's way less right. complicated. Yep. So he was like, yeah, I, um, I had to make a decision, you know, um, you know, to either stop playing and like I need to support my family. So he ended up going and working like a corporate job because they just had to pay the bills. I mean, when they were touring a lot, it was kind of cool because they, they all of them had jobs that let them leave and like tour and stuff. Sure. Like, you know, servers or whatever at restaurants. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, but then he had to make a decision. He's like at some point, I think like the lead singer got in trouble, you know, with DUIs or something like that. And he couldn't tour anymore and it kind of killed the whole thing. And oh yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> so many it it gets it gets stupid you you wake up one day and it's just over right Right. so i mean with me uh i when when i just you woke up one day and i I woke up one day and it was just kind of like here we are talking to a major label record that wants to throw a couple hundred grand at us in advances and we can't pull our shit together all of the sudden like after a couple of years of really hammering things out yep and all the investment all the time all the fun summers fun or fun summer activities we skipped to to just be in the studio and get one more take right girlfriends were broke up like all this and all of a sudden we're just too scattered and retarded with all the, all the new shiny things around us and we can't focus i like it wasn't me right that wasn't focused right so I, I I pulled the the rip cord and um, just moved on with my life. <laughs> Where were you at that point? Like, were you guys in California? Were you guys- we were actually in Missoula, Montana. <laughs> uh, we because a lot of bands we did a lot of research. A lot right. of bands pass through Missoula and will play at the University of Montana um, on their way to Seattle. They'll stop there. Interesting. Um, we <laughs> made a lot of contacts and we we were really close to be able to come down to salt lake and then reach down to southern california las vegas seattle portland i mean we were it was wasn't a central location but it was a good uh hub right um and and we were able to bump up to to canada and alberta and calgary and yeah i mean not the biggest cities but seattle at that point had been played out right late yeah. eight, late 90s early 2000s um anyway i <laughs> I don't, I don't even think or talk about that much anymore. I, I, for a while, that's all I talked about. Like, yeah, I was in a band. We had, a, we're talking to major labels and just didn't work out, but I, I was in a band. Would you play drums? Oh, you were the drummer, huh? I, I don't, I think what a lot of people don't realize though, about the drummers, I mean, what I, I've come to realize they set the tone. I mean, like if you, uh, like talking to my cousin and stuff, he's like, his drummer is super important as far as like the energy of. Oh yeah. Of the show, the energy of the recording session, the energy of like pretty much everything. He sets the tone. If the drummer's off, usually the whole band's off. So that, that's, that's kind of the context that I I wanted to draw from funny enough, uh, as far as mindset goes, right? Like I, (laughs) I I was able to sit in front of 500 people, 5,000 people, 10,000 people and play the same songs and, and stay cool. Like I, figured out how to condition myself to do that um so the band can do what they want you know lay down that 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 foundation the whole you know drummers that that get attention are not my favorite drummers right right like it's if uh, i forget who said this he was he was the current drummer in the late 90s for whitney houston and he he says if if someone ever comes up to me after a show and they say wow you're a great drummer he said, uh, I know I was doing my job wrong. Like it, it needs to be all about Whitney. <laughs> right. Right. Um, <clears throat> and when you're a band, you know, it's not like you're a, a backup, um, working stiff, uh, make, you know, holding up a single solo artist when you're a band, there's a little bit more play, you know, right. there's 
certain songs and elements within a show that'll feature different members of the band and uh, a good front man to a band often will keep bringing the audience back to like hey this is our whole band like guitar solo um you know wh- whatever it is yeah right and 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 so, but you know in order to you can have the best band in the world but if you have a crappy drummer it all falls apart yeah. you know it's it's like building a really nice house on on a mudslide um you can't get excited and play too fast right. you can't speed up and slow down during a song you, you need to lay that foundation and then anything above and beyond that is just icing on the cake yeah. and uh for me um i being able to stay cool while under it is a type of pressure. It is a type of stress. You're, it's a it's a you stress. You know, it's it's a good stress, but it, it's still an excitement. And be able to stay cool and perform under that kind of pressure takes some conditioning. It's practice. And so, you know, fast forward to competitive shooting. You know, when I was first learning, uh, it, it's interesting because I had the right mindset of a professional. Right. Uh, the clock goes off, but I didn't have the muscle memory yet. Unlike when I was a drummer, when I, I developed that mindset. So, you know, I, I actually hired a, a coach at a certain point when I started competing in, in multi-gun um, because I, I, I didn't want to develop bad habits. And I'd been through that with learning a, a musical instrument at a competent level. And I, I, I didn't want to start off wrong. I didn't want to learn things wrong and have to reteach myself. I understood the value of figuring things out right-ish the first time. And, right. But I mean, in multi gun, you got to be uh, disciplined in pistol, rifle, and shotgun, and uh, you need to be able to manipulate the the each plat- weapon platform uh, efficiently. But also, you know what you look at and how you hold it and how you stand, and it, they're they're all very very different disciplines. And so, when you're running through a course of fire, going as fast as you can, um, switching from a pistol to a shotgun and then to a rifle. Um, is you, you got to have that stuff down cold. It cannot be part of your conscious mind because you're thinking about the course of fire, your, your game plan on how you're going to execute. You can't think about like, all right, now I pull the trigger, right? It's the same thing with yeah. being a professional musician. You can't think like, all right, what's, what's my next chord? Uh, uh, bass drum, snare drum, bass drum, snare drum. Okay. All right. It, it, like all that. <laughs> It's like talking. I'm not. I'm not thinking about how the words I'm saying are spelled or a says ah, right? <laughs> right? So, um, it, but when you get it into the unconscious mind and, and you have those those neural pathways built, uh, it gets fun. But early on, uh, you know that mindset, of being able to stay cool under the pressure of a clock and um, execute uh, a, a perfect plan. Um, or I guess, I guess a course of fire uh, in the shooting sports. Um, it was a skill I already had, but I, I had to put in the time learning um, how to transition between guns, how to move, how to stand, how to, how to shoot and move, how to load and move. Um, at the same time, um, what to look for as I'm moving from one shooting position to the next, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of stuff I'd never really thought about. And um, so early on like my coach many many times would ask me so what were you thinking when that all went down because you know whatever shit show manifest yeah. <laughs> as opposed to the actual plan that was uh <clears throat> conceived uh I, I would literally say nothing i wasn't thinking about anything because huh. you, you can't have stuff in your conscious mind I was thinking about my, you know, a, a more appropriate answers. I was thinking about like, I shoot this and I move here and I shoot those and I switch to this gun. And I s- run over here and shoot those. <laughs> but in the meantime, I, I had to consciously think about reloading or whatever it was. And I, you know, I remember one time I grabbed my pistol mag and tried to cram into the loading port of my shotgun, right? Like just bad wiring right. that, that hadn't been completed. Huh. And, and so the idea about mindset um and and now you know i I don't have problems like that but it's more of uh it's not even having the mindset to stay cool under pressure it's more the mindset of uh seeing how uh focused i can be and and really push myself how quickly can i execute that 
plan of attack that 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 course of fire so yep. it's it's really kind of interesting uh how quickly can i see what i've already envisioned in my head doing how can i how quickly can i make that happen how many targets can i see at once while i'm shooting them in a particular order it's about expanding my my view it's about um yeah it, it's no longer about dealing with uh adrenaline and pressure <laughs> it's still exciting but I'm not allowed to enjoy it until I go back and watch the, the videos on my iPhone. Right. Um, that's when I can enjoy it. it, it I, I need to be a, a robot and uh, just execute when, when I'm in the moment, totally. which is its own bliss. Yeah. It actually, I, I just shot a match in Vegas uh, a couple of weeks ago now, um, exactly two weeks ago. And uh, it, it was a long, long, match um your, your average major match has uh 12 stages and you, you shoot uh 10 to 12 depending on how big they are um you'll shoot like five one day um three the next day and then two on a sunday and then they have the award ceremony and everyone flies home uh for example if it's a 12 stage thing it'll be like um five four and then four right uh, or six five four um, no, did you win? No, now I'm doing math. But did I, did I take first? No, yeah. I, I took I took third in my division and class. Right. Um, how do they break that down? Uh, do, like division and class. Like what is that? Like is so it based on age or what? No, no, not not age. Uh, divisions are are based off of um, the equipment you use. Yep. So, um, I I shoot the uh, the most popular division. Cause it's got the deepest field uh to go up against yeah. um if you know if you take second out of four guys it's not really impressive right uh but um division will be um based off of your gear so uh the one i shoot is uh in three gun is called tactical optics yeah tac ops <laughs> uh it you're allowed one optic you can put on any gun you want actually right um but it makes most sense to put a put it on your uh, rifle yeah. because you're shooting long range and uh up close stuff so i use a, a 1x to 6x variable zoom scope um and then uh shotgun semi-automatic pistol semi-automatic and you, you have you know very uh generous limitations on magazine length so it's not on capacity it's just your magazine can't be longer than 1.41 millimeters long mm -hmm. So if you can figure out how to get 50 rounds in that, cool uh, on, on your pistol, right? Or um, shotgun, um, you can hold as many rounds in your shotgun tube as you want, but you can only start with uh, eight in your tube. And so my, I have a 12 round shotgun tube. It looks goofy. It's the, the magazine tube sticks out further than the, than the actual barrel. <laughs> um, well, it looks goofy to other people. To me, right. when I see shotguns that don't have that now, because I just spend so much time with mine, right. I, I think, wow, that looks weird. So you kind of like turned into like a gunsmith just by proxy, just because you're shooting all the time and trying to modify your weapons to, uh, to benefit you as best as possible in your competition. If a gunsmith is a, a, a surgeon, I'm, I'm more of a field medic. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Like you, you gotta be able to maintain your gear. Yeah, but I mean, as far as whipping out a Dremel and grinding something down, some guys have, but no, I I, I have gunsmiths uh, um, that I send my stuff to. You know, one, one step away from being my pit crew. If if the shooting sports were um, as big as I'd like them to be, I would have a pit crew that followed me around, right? Right. But I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and so running the gear that I do, I, I need to be. I, I chose companies when I decided to get into this. I bought the gear that I knew was just going to run, uh, no matter how poorly I took care of my equipment to a, to a degree, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, I was, I was talking to my gunsmith on the way here for this interview, <laughs> admitting that I, I needed to clean a couple of my guns and just not that they weren't running, but I just feel bad because they're they're really nice guns. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean. You know, my, my dad taught me that every time you go shooting, you go home and you clean your guns, yeah. you take care of them. But I mean, I'm putting tens of thousands of rounds through these things every year. Like I, if I cleaned them every time I, I went out and shot them, 
one, um, I wouldn't have time for anything else. Two, um, frankly, uh, I, I need to know how my guns perform dirty because you don't have time to clean them when you're at a match, three, okay. three day match. And, and so when I zero my rifle, I'll put, I'll put 50 rounds through it before I, I start dialing my optic in because the ammo will perform differently going through that barrel dirty than it will clean. Yeah. But how, how long does your barrel stay clean? One, two, three rounds. So I'll, I'll make it adequately dirty, zero my optic, run a boar snake through it, and, and bring it home. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, it, it's those kinds of things that you you learn along the way. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't run gear. I won't allow sponsorship support from a, a company that I, I, I don't believe in. Um, it's, it's really easy with the level of attention I, I have on social media now and the, uh, uh, the amount that I shoot. Uh, I, I mean, I get offers from companies all the time. How did that start? If you don't mind sharing that, like for a sponsorship. So like you, you got into competitive shooting, <clears throat> you bought the gear that you knew would run, but at what point did, did you start getting sponsorships? Was it like, a, did people say like, man, this guy's good. We're going to sponsor him. Or did you have to like kind of pay your dues before you started getting some of those sponsorships in? Yes. I, I, I mean, <laughs> the, so my, my, you know, being in, in marketing, I can't, um, even do my own social media poorly. Yeah. I, you know, I, I was, I talked, I was talking to a buddy of mine that's a firearms instructor for, um, law enforcement and, uh, he, he's horrible at getting corporate support. Yeah infinitely better shooter than me or half the guys I go up against, but he's limited in capacity as far as what matches he can go to, because uh, I mean, it's a cop salary. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, well, you need to work on getting sponsors. That, that That's why. Right. Very few people can actually afford to shoot at the level and frequency that we want to. So he, but I, I was explaining to him as we were kind of going through it that, look, um, I'm really, really good at social media because I do it all the time for paying clients. Yeah. And so I couldn't just start like documenting my little journey in, getting into the shooting sports um, and suck at it. It's like you, you can't go and shoot and instruct at a high level and then just like go out with your buddies on the weekend and since it's just for fun and just for you, just start sucking because... Right. Like I don't even know how to do it poorly. It's just, there are certain things you need to do in order to do it effectively. And so, you know, after my wife and I had pretty much done having kids and we got a house, I started getting back into drumming. Okay. Right. And, um, that's where the Sean go boom name comes from. You scroll all the way to the bottom of my Instagram. It's, it's me, and, you know, drum Jam. stuff, but I, I mean, I would go to these, these, weekend drum camps with pros, you know, pros would go to these boot camps, get ready to go on tour. And it was just fun. I was rubbing shoulders with people, but I was practicing for an hour a day, sometimes a half hour in the morning and an hour at night. It was my, my stress outlet. And I was putting in a ton of work and then I'd come downstairs and, uh, you know, when it was time for dinner or whatever, and ask my kids or my wife, Hey, did you hear me when I was doing that one thing? <laughs> Uh, no, maybe you can play it for me later. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. You know, it, it was uh, very isolating. Yeah. It, it was a great meditative outlet. I, you know, after a long day of being around clients and coworkers and I didn't mind the alone part, but at the same time I'd accomplished something and I had to be the only one that cared. Um, and it, it worked for a while, but I also realized why am I getting good at this? Like, why am I putting in the time to get good other than it being intrinsically rewarding? I knew I didn't want to be a professional drummer. We already covered that. But right. I mean, there, I didn't even want to put in the work to join a band and be a weekend warrior. Like, no thanks. Even now you wouldn't? So if you had like a no. to just like do a local like. No. No. Hauling gear, the rehearsals, the egos and personalities. Like right. I, I deal with people and that kind of stuff in other capacities to where no, yeah. I, I, it's just so much work. I'm not, 
just to like have everyone get together, coordinate schedules, just to rehearse, plug in, put in time. And then somebody hasn't been working on their part. Right. And then, so we got to like take some time and then eventually we all enjoy how we sound so much that we're going to want to record it. And then you give a mouse a cookie. Like I just know how musicians think. That's funny. I've I've been in lots. I've played in lots of bands, right? right? I've, no. So, um, like very few people can just do it for the fun of it. So do you think shooting's like your creative outlet now? I mean, because totally. like, yeah, because I was gonna say, because my cousin still has that itch, right? He's like in corporate America, but they just released that single and like he, and so everyone of course is asking them like, oh, you guys getting back together? Are you guys gonna start touring? You know, it's like the offer would have to be exactly right. We'd have to have the, the perfect bus. I mean, everything needs to be like laid out exactly perfectly or they won't do it. They're like, no. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's just not worth it. Right. You, you love it, but not that much. Right. It's like that girlfriend, you know, you're never going to marry, but you can still have a good time with her. <laughs> but then as soon as you start having a good time, she wants commitment. Yeah. It's a great analogy. Obviously, I'm not talking about my wife because <laughs> we're... I think that goes without like, saying. Right. <laughs> but um, so the, the shooting thing, like I, I find things in common. Like, first of all, to get good at shooting, you got to spend time every day with your guns. Dry fire. Dry fire is an absolute must. Yep. I dry fire morning and night and I get to the range about once a week. Yep. You know, so the idea that, hey, you need a lot of, you don't need a lot of ammo to get good. Uh, you need not a lot of ammo to compete a lot. Right. Right. Um, you, and arguably you need a lot of ammo to get great. Right. But most people don't even get to the point of being good that, you know, so the excuse of like, uh, ammo, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. So, but you know, those repetitions, those, I, I mean, here, I, I, I find rhythms in things. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to play, uh, a repetition of a dry fire thing I'm, I'm doing with my pistol. So what I'm doing, uh, with my pistol is I'm, uh, drawing, inserting a magazine, racking the slide, and then shooting one round. Obviously, there's, there's, right. there's no round being uh, discharged. Um, and then I'm, uh, and then I'm reloading. So I'm dropping the magazine out, and then um, putting another one in, and then firing around. So it's draw load yeah. rack fire reload fire so there's two rounds being fired okay and uh my my part time my goal time to accomplish that is in three seconds okay it's fast um but it's it's not about being fast it's about building up perfect reps you build up the the neural pathways and just like learning how to play drums you, you start out at the speed to where you can play a pattern whatever it is perfectly right and you just get in the reps but it, unlike, say, weightlifting, it's not um, – you can get reps from weightlifting. You can get good results uh, by doing mindless reps. You just one, two, three. You know, if I'm going to do eight, yeah. they're really good bodybuilders. I understand, like, put in a lot of mental energy and concentration in every single rep. But um, with this, you know, you're, we're, I'm not trying to build muscle mass. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm building what, what they, you know, erroneously call muscle memory. Right. So, but I'm going to hold this up to the microphone because I want you to hear, hear this, this rhythm, this pattern. I mean, it sounds like the beginning of uh, Pink Floyd's money or something. Right. (laughs) Um, And, and I, but I'm hearing all those things. Yeah. Uh, like I, and I know what each one of those sounds are. And so for me, I can get into a groove yeah. and, and just do that over and over and over again and, and, um, just drive that into my subconscious. So if there's a, a weapons manipulation thing that I'm struggling with, maybe, and that's the other thing when I, when you're out on the clock and doing all this stuff on, uh, under the pressure of adrenaline, you develop bad neural pathways, bad habits. Yep. And they happen fast because of the excitement. Excitement actually enhances the learning process. So if you love what you do, you'll get good at it faster than if you hate it. Yep. 
um if you hate it with a lot of passion you'll never get good <laughs> but um that so inherently when you're under an adrenaline dump and you're you're executing um bad habits can creep in so it's really important to maintain skills while uh on the road at home so dry fire is is an absolute must but yep. that's the common ground I, I hear between me and drums like I, I didn't need to sit behind a real drum kit in order to learn certain things it'd be on a practice pad hands on knees or whatever and it's only been nah i was doing it last night like i i still tap out patterns like that i could still arguably sit behind a drum kit and do a few things that um will never atrophy because it's it's just such an ingrained part of me but now i i see myself envisioning myself doing things with my my guns i mean in my office i've got dry fire targets all over the wall and i i have a, a competition belt there um so during some downtime i can take five minutes and get some reps in um it, it is time consuming like you were saying but it it uh it's not as time consuming as getting good at and maintaining a musical instrument right believe it or not and so i, I found that it was more uh i found that it was more feasible to put in a few minutes of dry fire every day 10 minutes in the morning 10 minutes a night a little bit different than hour and a half to two hours a day right. my previous hobby still gear intensive i mean <clears throat> big ass drum set <laughs> three guns <laughs> yeah totally but um and then there was a social element so I, I go to these national matches now and i'm seeing my same buddies yep and uh, not all of us shoot the same division and when we do you know there there's those few seconds when we're on the clock and we're competing and it's fierce but it's one at a time so we're never like snarling and staring at each other in the eyes ready to and and so after hours it's it's i mean we'll we'll get together and go in on a on a on a verbo or an airbnb and like it it becomes a a frat house at night you know some guys like to get hammered every night i don't understand how they how they can just get up and be ready to shoot at 7 30 in the morning but not I, me <laughs> i mean you know but regardless it's it's uh, it's good times right yeah, we'll, for sure We'll barbecue steaks we'll eat like kings but it doesn't cost as much as a restaurant or a hotel yep. and uh we're all hanging out together some some guys will just pile in and sleep on the floor i, I have to have a bed you know i just yeah. i want to take care of myself but it, it's really something um and there's definitely something to that i think uh sebastian jungler talks about in his book tribe you know how like if you're surrounded by people that are like-minded that are doing the same things and you're in close proximity to those people it's like it's kind of what drives humans it's like you want to be around those kind of people so like it makes you feel alive you know it, it really does and yeah. honestly i have more friends that i'm in touch with all the time social media text i mean buddies will call me on my way to work yeah then i can think of at any other time certainly more than when i was a working musician yeah um so i've got these isolated moments because and i'm, I'm even socially driven like I, I don't want to suck the next time we go show up right because boy we give each other shit yeah yeah <laughs> what just some of the meanest things i i like if people didn't know how close we were the, the, the things we say to each other on the range off the range uh, just nasty right yeah. but it, it's it's that camaraderie and then i, I mean these guys are some of my best friends right yeah. um and and then you know my wife started wanting to do it with me and you know some guys will say oh i'll go to the range and get away get away from my wife but, like <laughs> i'm not trying to i'm not running away from that right right um and she just saw me i can do that yeah so i got her set up and uh, we, we figured out real quick that uh there's a limit to what kind of training we can do together so you know luckily i'm close friends with literally some of the best shooters in the world yeah and um she's friends with them too right. and she can call them and ask them and um i i don't know very many other contexts where i you know i'm, I'm okay with my my wife dming and and texting <laughs> all sorts of other dudes across the country right like nor is she with me like right. um and, and so 
it, it's it's just a it's an amazing community it, yeah, it's hard sure. to explain without being in it and, and we're constantly trying to bring other people into it how'd you get into it i mean you went from being the musician like you, you didn't I, I didn't want to practice at home anymore to some pointless end like well right. i guess i'm good at it no one's ever going to know about it, it the, i think the social element in me was calling yeah and um then something happened uh right after the sandy hook massacre or right before the sandy hook massacre my wife had bought me a a uh an hkp30 um the, the previous years had been uh a rough half decade or so um I had a business partner completely screw me over, lost everything, went from a very, very nice living to not being able to afford a diaper. And uh, I'd gone into survival mode and uh, was building everything back, basically. What and, was that business, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, or what kind of business? You don't have to be specific, but. It, it was in the financial sector. Okay. So this, this business partner literally um taken all of our assets and moved them into another entity mm. and uh mm. told me he wanted to buy me out and i said i didn't want to sell he said well i want you to buy me out then i said what the hell's going on and then he told me what he did wow um the the consequences of that level of fraud are uh yeah, it's, <laughs> um you know people went to federal prison because of that right um I was able to save face, uh, not that I was worried about it. I was more more about uh, feeding your family. <laughs> right. Um, but it was right around the um, financial crisis when yeah. everything crashed in 2008. Same month, I remember Black Monday. Um, and uh, it was it was ridiculous. But I mean, I had other businesses too, and um, but I just wasn't putting the energy into them that I was this main one because my partner and I had built it up. He was my best friend and business partner. Right. And um, like, you know, we, we, we put our hearts and souls into this thing and um, finally got it to a point where it was, it was really amazing. We were reaping the rewards. Right. Um, and, you know, I was young too. I'm 40 now. And at the time I was uh, in my late 20s. Yep. And uh, I thought I was way more amazing than I really actually was. Because I had the validation, yeah. the balance sheet validation. And uh, then, you know, I, I learned some stuff building, building back up. Um, I learned that I married the right person because yeah. she stuck with me. I mean, I know guys that were divorced, not, not by their choice because of the, the financial crash, but yep. um, I, I know guys that off to themselves because of the, the financial crash i i mean how'd you build back up what did you what was your first move like because like the only reason i, I had a me. i had a web design agency <clears throat> yeah that i hadn't put a lot of uh resources into yeah and uh and it became my primary form of income and i i had bought into it but it wasn't really a craft and uh i figured out how to make that work because you know I just needed something to sell to somebody. Yeah. And um, after the financial crash, a lot of businesses were being very, very frugal with their marketing mo money. And uh, so they didn't want to dump it unnecessarily into old traditional media. They wanted to leverage the internet to reach more people, yeah. which is what they should have been doing anyway. Um, and uh, even back then, <laughs> that was 10 years ago, 11 years ago, right? And um, that's kind of how I got into marketing. I got to, I majored in psychology. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> kind of go uh, hand in hand if you well, think about it though. Psychologists are nothing but uh, statisticians with a fancy for human behavior. And, and you know, marketing, you're, you're just, you're taking qualitative elements and uh, forcing it into uh, quantitative metrics to try to draw conclusions, right? Yeah. So like, well, 500 people bought from the uh, blue version of that e-commerce site and uh, only 300 bought from the green version. I guess we're going to scale up on the blue side and shut down the green side and, you know, split testing. And uh, now I'm going into the nerdy stuff. But I mean, my, my point is for a period of time, I had to sell all the guns I owned. We sold everything that wasn't nailed down. Wow. In order, you know, after we ran out of 
r- savings and runway. And uh, I mean, my wife was expecting our second child. I mean, <laughs> stress level. We, we lost a house. Um, you know, it, it was, it was uh, very, um, it was stressful, but you know I'm good at compartmentalizing and staying cool under pressure. I learned how to do that as a musician, and so I just knew what had to happen. You know, I had my moments for sure, but I, you know, I'll have a little victory that won't solve, but maybe three to five percent of our problems. But now we only have ninety five percent left to solve instead of a hundred percent, right? Yep. Um, and things would get incrementally better every month, and after a couple of years. We were out of survival mode, but I let everything go. I got fat. I got out of shape. I developed back problems. Um, my 30s were not a pretty time, right? <laughs> uh, the first seven years of them anyway. And uh, and then I was finally able to start getting back into shape, right? And then after I got into shape, I, I just didn't. After sitting all day, I didn't want to come home and sit behind a drum kit and blow off steam i wanted to go for a run go to the gym but at a certain point going to the gym is just not enough right um and my wife bought me this pistol um she knew that if there was one pistol that i could get back that i had to sell it would be hkp 30 it just fit my hand i could shoot it most accurately it was an hk so i knew it would run no matter what and uh she found one got it for me a week later no, days later was the Sandy Hook massacre, and all of a sudden you couldn't buy magazines, you couldn't find ammo. Everything was getting hoarded because everyone was afraid Obama was going to take all the guns, and yeah. which he didn't. Uh, but you know, the the industry really capitalized on it, and uh, it, it was weird for a long time. But uh, all of a sudden, that woke something up inside me. I forgot. I love to shoot. Hmm. Well, got my concealed carry permit just because felt like, if anything else, having a concealed carry permit makes just purchasing a gun go a lot smoother yep. um, and faster, is whether you elect to carry or not. Um, and but like, okay, cool. Now I have a permit and I can go to the range and put ten or twenty rounds into a piece of paper. You know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 yards out. Cool. There had to be more. Right. It took me a little bit. But I I found, uh, and I started looking at, like, tactical classes. Man, the internet's saturated with tactical teachers that... Tactical. They, they, they claim so many things, right? right? And there's just so much garbage out there. And I didn't know what how to sift through it. Cause I wasn't a practitioner yet. Yeah. I didn't know how to think through it. And I was just a normal guy that wanted to shoot more. And I didn't want to spend eight, 900 bucks on a, on a four day class learning something that was going to wind up being garbage. I didn't want to spend $900 on that. I'd rather buy another gun, which most people would, right. um, or buy more ammo and go figure stuff out myself. Um, but I didn't know what I wanted to practice. Um, I wasn't even sure how I wanted to carry, you know? <laughs> and so, I, I mean, I, I, had, I tried all sorts of carry ankle holsters, uh, kidney carry, small of the back, appendix, outside the waistband, inside the waistband. What do you prefer now? Uh, I've been carrying appendix the last uh, three months or so, just kind of switched over. Mm. How's that driving? What's that? How's that driving? Like when you're like, cause it's uncomfortable for me. I don't, I don't like carrying appendix at all. No, uh, I mean, how's carrying at four o'clock driving? You got to sit your ass. You, you got to lean up against it, right? Like, yeah. um, the right holster, the right belt, um, practice working through all those. It was horrible the first week, yeah. but I couldn't deny that I could draw and get on target significantly faster, right. single-handed or freestyle, right. and and so. I mean, the evidence is there, so that's the way forward, then, huh? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I used to call it "shoot your dick off, carry," <laughs> but I don't, I don't carry a striker fire gun, so that's that's not really an, an issue. Um, it's a hammer gun, double action, single action, so um, it's not going to go off and shoot 
<laughs> me down there. <laughs> right. Uh, so, but I mean, and then I heard about these pistol competitions. And so I, I tried IDPA, USPSA, unsanctioned weird ones. Because, you know, you can pay 15, 20 bucks. You show up with ammo, some extra mags, some gear, and you can shoot. And yeah. you get to see what you're capable of. And then you meet people that are better at it and you talk to them. And they tell you, hey, you should go talk to so-and-so about lessons. And um, everyone's really nice. People come from all sorts of different, diverse walks of life. Yep. Your, your average white male Republican with a beer gut just is not the dominant person. Right. I mean, the last match I, I shot, a, a trans person came up and said hi to me. Hey, I follow you on Instagram. I love your stuff. <laughs> right? Like, I, um, uh, a, yeah, multiracial, multigender, multi. Uh, yeah. um, Political affiliation. Yeah. yeah. That's another big thing. You yeah. know, um, I, I've, I've been asked by private um all gay male uh, shooting clubs to come out and teach. Right. They asked me not to say who they are uh, because of one, their community, right? Uh, the, the gay man community, whatever <laughs> that is, right? The, the their their social crowd because right. it's not accepted widely. Yeah. Um, but then also their uh, sexual orientation. They're they're worried about the uh, stigma of the white male republican evangelist that that's going to judge them right right so they're, they're they, they've just got their own little group yeah. but they've reached out to me and i don't, I don't know why they felt comfortable like i, I guess i've no, given no reason why they shouldn't right, right. um because end of the day the second the rights that the second amendment protects and guarantees they're not see they're not second amendment rights they're they are inherent natural human rights the second amendment of the constitution um, protects and guarantees um, belong to everybody. Totally. And, and so while, while the loud mouth um, stereotypical folks uh, uh, w- want to say everything they want to say, like it, it actually belongs to the liberals too. Not just, it's not a conservative, right? Right. Um, e- even, even the, you know, the growing female population, now I've talked to females about this um, that are actually proficient in the shooting sports or as as uh, firearms instructors, and they hate the idea of the movement that uh, Second Amendment rights are women's rights, female empowerment. That that whole idea. Um, I, I may, I've made the observation before, and I'll, I'll I'll say it again that whenever somebody says female empowerment, they're selling something, right? I'm in marketing. That's a story. You are triggering heartstrings. You're pulling on um, hearts and minds. Uh, you're selling something. Right. Whether it's an election, whether you're trying to buy votes, whether um, you got a product, female empowerment, give me a break. When it comes to natural human rights, I, I don't like the separation. You know, the, the idea of gun classes for women, I like the concept in that there are women that are uncomfortable going into what they would perceive as an all male dominated yeah. whatever. And so they, they want a uh, comfortable environment to at least get the start. But I think there are way too many female only um, classes being offered that uh, it's a marketing ploy, Like you said though, yeah, I think. they're selling so, something. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and I, I, <clears throat> I have this vision of, uh, you know, for example, I mean, you see articles um, in gun magazines, blogs, videos about buying a gun. You know, uh, top 10 things women should look for when buying a gun, right? What you need, honey, is one of them uh, pink handle wheel guns over there. It's not complicated. Your tiny little lady brain can handle it, right? Like, <laughs> give me a break. It's so stupid. Tiffany blue Cerakote. I, I, I just, how a gun fits in the hands. Right. Of a human, the principles are the same, regardless of what's between legs or uh, gender roles that one personally identifies with. Right. Um, now, how you can seal on various different types of clothing, that's different, right? Yeah. But as far as like once it's out of the holster and your hands come together, 
<laughs> side alignment, trigger control, like body mechanics, how you stand. All those things are the same. Uh, everyone's body is a little bit different, so you got to adjust that for yourself. Um, but I mean, it. I, I just I just like to talk to humans about shooting guns. Yeah, I, I I've I've found joy in teaching, sharing what I know. I have a hard time uh, um, doing it too much because my my main love is competing, and I want to continue to get better and uh, um, climb the ladder and win. You know, I, I I'm winning local matches and regional, and I'm I'm working on uh, national finishes now. Right. That's yeah. it, it's just progression. So, is there a good financial reward for those kind of matches? I'm mean, I'm completely ignorant to shooting matches and like what the prize money is, and so if there is even prize money, um, it <clears throat> there is prize money uh, or prize tables. So often, you know, it's, it's not a spectator sport, right? That's a funny thing. Like, I just won this national title. Crickets, no one cares except the other shooters that didn't get it and yeah. are happy for you. And then after the awards, everyone flies home. It's Monday morning and we're back to life. Yeah. And, you know, people will post it on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, whatever. But really, no one cares. Yeah. Right. Um, or, or, you know, there will be major matches. It'll be like the, the uh, 2017 Lucas Oil put on a, a match, the 2017 Lucas Oil pistol caliber carbine world championship or something like that yeah so whoever whoever wins is the 2017 lucas oil pistol caliber carbine world champion yeah there were some russians there i think so i mean it was legitimately international yeah um <laughs> it's like two russians <laughs> <laughs> so i mean that's uh, that that's what i like about it though it's it's so i can rub shoulders with world and national champions and 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 some of them are my friends and I, yeah. I can, I, I can pull them aside and ask them questions. I can call them up and say, Hey, look at this video. What am I missing here? What happened? Oh, you're a totally, you know, fill in the blank, whatever. And, right. um, that that's special, right? Yeah. Um, company support is, is where, uh, the, the incentives come from. And so certain, certain matches don't have prize tables. Others do. Um, that's the most common now though. Some will have a cash prize for the top finishers. Mm -hmm. Um, but what do you mean by prize table, by the way, literally a table with prizes on it. So Hmm. they'll divide it up by division, go with the biggest division, say, all right, first place, um, tactical optics, you get to go up and pick. So there, there'll be uh, certificates for silencers, rifles, high end optics down to flashlights and gun lube. Obviously, the good stuff gets taken first. So, I, as your name gets read, but usually, unless you're in the top or in the, you know the bottom twenty percent, there's something for everybody, and that's what's really cool about it. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm sponsored by Vortex Optics, and if I walk up and uh, pick something from Night Force Optics, it's a really nice optic. I can turn around and sell it. Yeah. Um, well, the the proper etiquette is to thank the sponsors of the match. I'll I'll tag Night Force and show them what I want. Thank you for supporting the shooting sports. They get their exposure. People that attend the match see the 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 support that they did for the match, and then what I do with it is my business. Yeah, right. So, um, especially since I have an optic sponsor, I, I can't be seen shooting it anyway. <laughs> right. So, um, I would love to sell it at a discount. Obviously, I can't sell it for MSRP because why would anyone buy it from me when they could just buy it from Optics Planet or whatever? Right. And 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 so um, somebody else gets a really nice Night Force optic at a discount and it encourages them to maybe go out and shoot more. Yeah. So it's it's a fantastic grassroots sort of thing. And different matches are put on by different sanctioning bodies and um, they, they vary widely. You know, all all pistol matches um, don't have nearly the prize tables that multi gun matches do. Yeah. And uh, if you're shooting in a smaller division, um, you can place better and get better stuff. So, you know, you got your trophy hunters. I like competing in the deepest field to see where I stack up. I mean, I got sponsors. I'm not in it for the prizes. I've got sponsors that'll pay for my match fees, provide me with the equipment. I mean, I, I, I'm there to test my metal. Right. 
Is that your bread and butter at this point? As far as how I feed my family? Right. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a businessman. Uh, my, my bread and butter comes from multiple streams of income. Uh, where I spent most of my time? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the, the fiscal compensation doesn't come from uh, match performance nearly as much as it does. The companies that support me to be able to compete um, will also retain me to do promotional videos, um, shout their stuff out on Instagram, um, teaching lessons. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to do this as my main source of income because I like it. Right. Kind of back to that. Yeah. If I had to, if I had to perform at a high level in order to be able to feed my family, it, it would ruin it for me. Too much pressure. No, it's not the pressure. It's, it's the, uh, it just takes the enjoyment out. Right. When I'm in business mindset, it, it, it's just different. Uh, I, I like the, uh, the hunt um, and the nurturing of, of client relationships, raising investment money for uh, a side venture, or I, I, I like those types of social interactions, but it's not the same thing as a shooting. Now, I'm, the shooting's a personal thing. I, yeah. I want to see how high I'm capable of going. It bleeds into how I operate as a businessman. Right. Um, there are a lot of common threads but it's not the same thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Like, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> some people like to hunt for, you know, the pure enjoyment. Like there's, there's so many benefits that come from going out and hunting with a child or with your dad or with buddies, right? Yeah. Some people like to do it alone. But hunting when you know if you don't bring something back or and your family's going to starve yep that's just a different it's just different yeah definitely so um everyone needs an outlet but at the same time you know it, it's funny i can't not apply who i am in business to other stuff yeah. you know I, i'm still me i like to compartmentalize my life as much as anyone humanly can but I, I can't not be a businessman. So that means I'm really good at getting sponsorship support. I know how to talk to businesses. Right. I know how to be a product spokesman. Uh, the joke is, uh, you know, one, maybe one day I'll be able to run my guns as good as I run my mouth. Right. <laughs> uh, who taught you that though? Who taught you how to be, who taught you marketing? I mean, you, you obviously went to school for psychology, but like, where did you just like trial and error type thing? Or is it something that your dad was into? No. I mean, I, you my tell parents me are like, government employees. Right. <clears throat> uh, uh, part of it's, uh, well, it was necessity. Yeah. I, I learned cause I had to, um, you know, after, after my, my main bread and butter, uh, disappeared because of a dishonest business partner, I, I had this website company. I had to figure out how to sell websites. Yeah. I know how to talk to people, but, um, you learn real fast when you have to. Yeah. Um, and I found joy in it for a long time though. It was just kind of like this. I'm going to do this until I get, you know, one of my other business projects up and running and, uh, you know, they're up and running and I'm still doing it. I, I found value in it. I found value in being able to build relationships with other business people yeah. that I can draw from six, 12, 18 months down the road that I wouldn't know otherwise to do. Like I, I just pulled, several people from very, very different facets of my business life together this week because I saw an opportunity to where they could all fit. Yeah. I, and it turns out that I, I think the common thread is I'm really good at uh, building relationships and uh, piecing together teams to get stuff done. Yeah. Um, I wasn't very good at marketing, so I, I would sub out different things to other people that would um work that into the cost of whatever i was selling to whatever business owner yeah. and when i'd have success then they'd tell their friends and other people would call not all of them were successes <laughs> yeah. yeah um and 
I mean, have you ever heard a bad song on the radio? Ever seen a bad commercial? Yeah. You ever decided not to buy something because of a marketing campaign? I mean, uh, you know, we're just humans. But, uh, and, and so, you know, when it bled over into this, like the sponsorship thing and shooting came from uh, me documenting my journey getting into shooting uh, on social media. And people saw it and as they did more more people followed and uh, my following grew fast yeah. <laughs> relative to the community anyway right and uh and i had people asking me all sorts of questions what i thought about this oh, should i get this kind of gun or use this kind of ammo or and i i would answer i'd tell them what i think and why yeah and it put me in into this weird position of uh perceived authority I'm just a dude. I, I don't have a tactical beard. I, I didn't serve in the military. No law enforcement background. I'm just a dude with a, a wife and kids that likes to shoot. And I, I had painted this lifestyle. And then uh, one day, HK reached out to me and said, hey, we have an opening on our shooting team we'd like you to consider. And it was weird. Um, I, I said yes. I responded to the email and said, we need a response within 48 hours. And, you know, at 47 hours, I, I sent an email out and then immediate panic set in like, oh shit, what did I just do? What did I just commit to? They're going to find me out. I'm a fraud in that. Like I didn't have any national titles. I didn't like have some sort of extensive background, but I was out there shooting regularly, not totally sucking most of the time. <laughs> But I mean, I, I had just decided to learn how to shoot three gun instead of just doing pistol competitions. And so I was in the middle of like learning three gun. So my first three gun match, I had uh, been asked to join the HK shooting team. They sent me a, a box of swag. I, already, I was already running an HK pistol and rifle. And it was, it was October 2016. And I was given uh, for their their promotion that month. They were uh, um, doing breast cancer awareness. So my first three gun match, I was wearing a pink HK <laughs> shooting T shirt, going to a local match. Didn't know anybody except this this coach I'd hired to become a friend. Yeah, that was my first three gun match, and I'm wearing a damn pink HK shirt, right? Like, and no, but I mean. No one knew that that was my first three gun match. Yeah. I had shot other matches before. So, you know, I was, I was just getting started in another shooting sport. And then from there, like I, I've just been addicted and I, I don't really want to shoot any other sports or divisions. Um, I'll, I'll do pistol matches to keep my pistol skills sharp for three gun. Um, I'll, I'll shoot shotgun matches for the same reason. Uh, I'll, I'll go to rifle matches for the same reason. Uh, it, it, it's about, keeping and juggling those those three very very different platforms you know and for rifle you got to be good at shooting stuff up close and fast and then going into long range mode and pushing a 223 Remington round out to six seven hundred yards well beyond where it's combat effective or was designed to be used because it's a sport right okay. <laughs> dealing with massive bullet drop compensation <laughs> and uh um you know, shotgun, you're switching between buckshot, birdshot, slugs. You're shooting slugs at a target 50 to 100 yards out and then uh, shooting knockdown steel with birdshot. But if you shoot the knockdown steel with a slug, you're automatically disqualified because it's not safe. Um, if you mess up and shoot birdshot at a slug target, not a damn thing's going to happen. <laughs> right? right. And, you know, pistol, uh, that just atrophies fast if you don't keep it up. Yeah. Th those pistol skills are very, very perishable. So, um, if, if I'm having a busy week, I, I, I make sure I touch my pistol every single day, even if it's just five minutes yep. just to maintain. And so, and then everyone was cool. And then everyone was cooler in the multi-gun world than in the pistol leagues I'd been shooting. And I, I really like these guys. Everyone's more laid back and, um, you, you definitely don't get bored cause you're switching like, all right, this is a shotgun rifle stage. All right, this is an all pistol stage. Next one is rifle pistol. You know, it, it, and there's not one way to shoot it. You, you got to figure it out yourself. And people are trading 
ideas and they'll argue, well, I think this is faster if you go over here first and then switch to that gun or whatever. And, and then you get on the clock and you see, and, uh, it's just, I think everyone should do it. <laughs> you know, yeah, in my sure. head, it's, it's something that. Is your wife doing three guns too? Mm-hmm. I've seen some of her Instagram videos. I'm like, damn, she's so fast. Five, five foot two, 110 pounds soaking wet. And she's running a 12 gauge shotgun. That's arguably as uh, long as she is tall, <laughs> probably a few inches shy of that. But I mean, <laughs> those 12 round tubes, right? She's running a 24 inch Breda and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, but yeah, she's right there with me. That's awesome, man. You think that's brought you guys closer, like doing the same stuff, like kind of like you're saying, like some guys get go to the range to get away from their wives, but it's like you guys have a commonality in that where it's like, no, we we enjoy doing this together. Is it yes and like, no? Can, can you teach her? Like, do you have patience to do that? Because I don't know if I would. Like with my wife, I don't know if I have the patience to. I have the patience to teach her. Right. Um, she doesn't always have the patience to learn from me. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, if if she has a uh, an insight into something that I'm missing. I have to really push my ego out of the way in order to receive it. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, the first major match we shot together um, was a huge challenge because at local matches, you know, you just show up and it's just kind of whatever. It, it, it's practice. But at a major match, uh, there's a, an extra feeling of pressure. Like the cost of airplane, hotel, the amount of ammo you're using. Entry fees, a local match costs 25 bucks to get into. A, a major match is anywhere from two, 300 bucks to get into per person, right? Yeah. And, and then, you know, you're, you're just on the national scene, right? Not more people are watching and um, food, rental car. Uh, it's just an expensive weekend. Yeah. Without sponsors, I just couldn't do it. It's a $2,000 weekend. Right. And if you're doing it every month, geez. Yeah. So, Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm in alpha male, like hunt and kill mode. When I'm out there, I'm thinking of it, as soon as I finish a stage, I'm putting that out of my mind, no matter how good it was, uh, no time to celebrate, no matter how bad it was, no time to feel bad. I'm thinking about the next one. Yep. Right. And that automatically makes me an insensitive, unnurturing husband. Right. And she has, while she's seen me like that, it hasn't been for three days straight, nonstop. Right. And so it can, you know, we've, we had to learn how to um, understand each other in that environment. We'd never, ever been in that kind of environment. And for, from her perspective, she's competitive, but it's also her first major match. And so she is lacking experience. She's feeling extra amounts of pressure and the jitters and um other things uh you know memorizing the stage plans isn't isn't sinking in as fast as it normally does for her because like you know just the extra anxiety yeah and i've totally been there too and if i go too long without shooting major matches that all comes back that's dealing with that as a perishable skill right. and then you're, you're taking so much mental energy to push it off by the time the buzzer goes off and you're supposed to be running down range shooting, uh, you can forget <laughs> what you're supposed to be doing. Like it's, yeah. it's interesting. So, oh boy, we had some moments. Um, and, and so, but I mean, I had some stupid moments at major matches. Um, but, <laughs> you know, we, one of the biggest life lessons though is uh, that I've learned from watching some of the top competitors is they all, will have a moment at, at some match at some point during a season, if not multiple moments where they'll just make a dumb decision or they'll just shit the bed and everything will fall apart. Everything will go wrong. It's very gear intensive, malfunctioning ammo. Maybe you didn't clean your mags as well as you should have, or you're standing outside of a, a foot fault line. So every target that you shoot at, when uh, uh, your foot is outside of the designated shooting area right. is a, a massive penalty. <clears throat> Every engagement, right? Yeah. Um, uh, or, or you know, there will be a small safety infraction. You'll get disqualified. Uh, and the ability, 
let's just say you have a bad stage for whatever reason. Um, the difference between champions, the ones that actually win, and, the, and then the ones that just fall apart, are the ones that can just let it go, move on, and go shoot the next one. Some guys, you know, play in the middle of the road with that, where they're like, okay, that was bad. Now I got to make up for lost time. Now I got to go extra fast in the next one in order to make that damage that I just did less. And no, like you can't go faster than you're capable of going. And you damn well better have a stage plan to go and shoot at the edge of your capabilities anyway. Yeah. Like what's <laughs> what you're going to all of a sudden be able to do a uh, 110% of your capabilities. Like that, that's false thinking. Right? right. And so, you know, that, that's something that has worked for both of us is being able to let the past be the past and just move forward and do, do your best to the next one. Yep. And, you know, I have a bad month in business. All right. March just ended. What's April going to look like? Not to say this March was bad. I'm, you know, right. but I mean, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Get back to work. For sure. Period. End of story. And, um, you have a ritual of how you get into the zone. Mm-hmm. What is it? Uh, it's funny you should ask. Um, that, that's a really common thing. Uh, I, I have a friend uh, in Las Vegas that belongs to a group called uh, MVP, Merging Vets and Players. Yeah, I've heard of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, a really cool group, cool group of guys. And he's he's not a vet. He's a player. Uh, he, he played for an NFL team. Which right. one? I don't know. We're friends. We talk all the time. And I don't know what team he played for. But I, I don't even know if you could tell his friends that I shoot for HK. So. All right. Um, getting into the zone for me, uh, it's a process. So some guys like my buddy, Josh Tarrant, who's just one of the best in tack ops right now. Um, he, he'll literally, uh, tell himself, um, engage the mechanism like that. That's kind of his, his trigger word. Yeah. Um, and, and, and for me, the zone is, isn't a, an on or an off switch. It's a, uh, a crescendo and then a day crescendo to into and out of. And so uh, you're in the shooting sports, you're, you're putting a squad. It's kind of like foursomes in golf. So if you ever played a golf tournament, all right, um, foursome number 12 is going to start on hole 12, right? And then right. You, you finish uh, after you go through 18th, your 18th hole will then be hole 11, right? right? Um, same thing. Squad five starts on stage five or whatever it is. And, and, uh, we're, we're putting the squads and it can be anywhere from a half a dozen to a dozen people, depending on how the match is laid out and how many stages, how many people are enrolled and what division, all that. And, uh, so if you're first shooter on a stage, the next stage, you'll be the last shooter. Yep. That's how it goes. Okay. Um, they'll usually do it by alphabetical and then they'll hit uh, a randomizer button. And then that's, that's the order. And that's the shooting order for the entire match. It just, you know, rotates. And, uh, so, after someone's done um, going through the course of fire, um, everyone helps reset. So we're, we're, we're taking uh, tape and taping over the holes in the, the cardboard targets, picking up steel, resetting it, spray painting it, and we get it ready for the next person. Right. It's a total volunteer sport. Um, there are only a couple of matches where they'll do it for you, at least in the U.S. But um, it also gives you a chance to kind of walk through the stage and, and you know, look at it at a major match i'll uh, i'll go through the day before the match starts and video everything and come up with general stage plans and then review what i'm going to be shooting that day the morning before i leave and so i'm you know i'm preparing so i've 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 consumed the whole match at a macro level and then i look at what i'm shooting on day one i'll watch those videos but i i I'll, i i'm very careful not to say this is the way it is i'm still flexible and fluid at this point and then I'll show up to a stage early and uh, the the range safety officers who are kind of like the referees will uh, read the stage description and then give you everyone five minutes to walk through. Okay. So that's when you solidify your plan. And then at that point, I, I, I've taken a blurry mental picture and crystallized it and made it clearer and clearer. And I'll, I'll visualize myself shooting it, like how many steps I need to take to the left, any landmarks. So if there's like a visual barrier, but I know there's, four targets behind it. As I'm moving forward, I'll have my gun presented and I'll look at a, like a screw in the, or a crack or a knot in the wood 
or something and use that as kind of my mark to know that as soon as the target's there, I'm pulling the trigger. Um, and I'll, I'll just visualize all those things. And yeah. I, I walk through it and then I'll, I'll go uh, turn off the electronic component on my ear protection and visualize myself doing it no fewer than five times. Yep. Um, and like, I mean, I'm in, I'm visualizing the sites kind of like a, a first person perspective video game. That's how yeah. I'm seeing it because that's how I see it go down when I'm sure actually yeah. doing it. And then the ideally when, when I'm actually doing it, my, my mind doesn't know any different between physical reality and what I've been imagining because I, I try to envision at that deep of a sensory level yep. and, uh, and I'm just doing it one more time, but that time I'm actually doing it. Right? right in the physical world um uh, so that that's kind of my, my my pre um build up and then i'll uh i'll turn my back to the shooter that shoots before me so when i'm on deck i'll turn my back because i don't want to watch him shoot it he'll probably have a different stage plan than me and if he screws it up i don't want to see i don't want to visualize that yeah right so i i'll i'll just turn my back and look at the ground and I'll, I'll hear the RO and the, the, the cue is um, after you are ready to go, everything's loaded and you're standing in the start position, the, the RO will ask, are you ready? You nod your head, stand by, and then you hear the beep of the buzzer and uh, it's go time. So I'll just listen to that RO because that's the RO that I'm going to hear when I go in a few minutes. And I'll imagine myself going through all the course of fire in the right time. I'm not going to rush it. I'm not going to say, all right, I go here and then I run over here. Like I, I, I see everything happen. And then, um, and then when I hear, if you're finished, unload and show clear, which is the, the, the safety command for when a shooter is done with the course of fire. And, um, I'll, I'll turn around and go, uh, um, walk through it one more time because if when you're on deck you don't need to help reset right. but if you're if you're not on deck you need to help reset um and I'll, I'll walk through it one more time um which is hard because if there's steel it's probably still on the ground so i, I just got to be able to see where it is and know where it's already at because i've already walked it and then uh i'll immediately go over to the table where i have loaded magazines and everything just sitting ready to go and then since it's a multi-gun match you you wait for the RO and then they call you down next shooter up and you, you stage the last gun you're going to be shooting first. And uh, they're sitting on staging tables or dump buckets. Um, you get your sight picture, you chamber around and then you stage it and then you walk up range to the second gun you're going to shoot and then come to the starting line and then make your first gun you're going to be using ready last. And, um, get a sight picture and then I'll mentally run through it one more time. All right, I start here. This is the first thing I'm going to be looking at and shoot on the buzzer and then just run through it like fast forward, just you know, run over there and over there. And uh, then um, I just, the only thing in my head is the first thing I'm going to do because I know as soon as I do that first thing, my memory is set to where it'll trigger what I, I, I literally push everything out of my conscious mind, my, my working memory, everything else in the stage because at this point i either have it rehearsed and i know what i'm doing next choreography wise yeah or i don't right like same thing when i was in a band i i'm not thinking about you know all right this is how the intro starts i'm not thinking about what i'm going to be playing during the guitar solo at the end that'll just happen when it happens yeah and then i i become because at that point i'm just present past no longer exists. The future doesn't exist yet. I am just here. I'm holding my gun. I'm looking at the target, or if I have to do an unloaded start, I'm looking at my magazine because I'm going to grab that first and ram it into my gun and shoot something. Yeah. I'm facing the target. And so my last visualization is almost uh, fast forward, and then I rewind myself back to now. It's kind of my way of clearing any sort of anxiety, worry. I'm not thinking about my kids. I'm not thinking about, did I leave the stove on? I don't even have a stove. I, I, might as, I, I could be homeless. Yep. I mean, some matches I've been at and I've, it's just a horrible business week. Yep. Shit is falling apart. But at the moment I am supposed to be shooting, like none of that exists. And it's such a blissful 
um, suspended state. And I wish I could exist there more, but I'm using the shooting sports as a way to visit there. Super meditative. <clears throat> it's extremely there. meditative. Yeah. I mean, even dry fire, that, that's where I'm able to go. Yeah. It helps me wind down before uh, I go to bed. And it, when I do it in the morning, it, 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 it gets me dialed in to face the shit throughout the workday or, you know, all the successes. And then I'll go and execute it and, and I'll think, ah, oh, geez, that was so slow or whatever. And then watch the footage. I, I love the, the feeling of like, why wasn't I fast enough? And then going back and, you know, and then hearing the time thinking, whoa, really? Yeah. And, and, and then looking at the, the footage on my iPhone uh, that, you know, whoever I handed it to to film me right. did and, and seeing, like, wow, that was really smooth. Or, you know, the opposite, like, damn, I just burned that down. That was awesome. It was so fast. And you go watch it and you're like, nope, I was just panicking. And your perception of psychological time is, is interesting. For sure. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's just uh, like I've done my homework. Like I dry fire every day. If there's a skill that a stage requires that, that I just haven't worked on or developed, I, I can't worry about it then. Yeah. I'll come back to that match next year and kill it. Otherwise, I'm just going to do the best I can. Sometimes, you know, the penalty of a target that I just can't hit, which doesn't happen anymore, but early on, like, I'll, I'll take a few shots at it. But if I can't nail it, I'll just take the penalty for I've missed that target and then move through and, and take care of the rest. Yeah. And, and, and wind up somewhere in the middle, right? It's, it's better than, you know, some guys are like, do or die. I'm just going to, they'll, they'll go to war with a single target and then our time for that stage will hit and then they'll get penalties for everything else they didn't shoot at because they were so stuck on making something spin around or fall down or just hit yeah. that they don't have the skill set to execute on and that's but that's the other thing right like I'm, I'm in the moment but sometimes a lot of times it doesn't go how you visualized it right 80 percent, sure but there will be something different and you need to be able to make decisions split second decisions about how you're going to handle it because you know the rules so well because you have all your contingency stuff in place i i so for example with a shotgun that's the only thing that you don't have box magazines for i can't just grab another magazine full of rounds you, you got to cram them into the tube so we do a thing called quad loading where we'll grab four shells in our hand at a time and ram them in through the loading port and uh because it's faster yeah I can turn my shotgun over after firing around, ram uh, uh, four more shells in and get back on target in under two seconds because I practice that. But you plan your load. So I'm going to go shoot these five over here. Now I'm down to four rounds because I started with nine in the gun. I need to load eight while I'm moving across the range, the bay to this other area. And then I've got six more targets to shoot. But, you know, I have a, a whole bunch that uh, I can... Um, that that are in there for contingency right or maybe i can get away with just loading four but i can only miss once so you're counting in your head while you're doing all this i'm not counting how many i have in my tube right. i plan I, I count it out when i'm coming up with my stage plan i just right. know that when i'm on the left side that i can only afford to miss twice um if i'm going to stick with my my main plan then i know yeah. how many i'm going to load as i'm moving to my next position right. if you're not shooting you're moving and loading right. um you're always doing more than one thing. Like when I'm putting down my shotgun with my left hand, I'm drawing my pistol with my right. So I'm not wasting time. It's, you learn how to be efficient. You learn how to, um, you think about everything differently. Yeah. Um, it, cause oftentimes it's not about rushing. It's not about trying to accomplish something faster than you're capable. It's just about economy of motion. It's about planning. It's about budgeting. Right. Uh, so I, I just know that if I, as I move from position six to position seven, that I'm going to load eight more rounds yeah. or whatever it is. Cause I've, I've counted it out. And then you see a target that you didn't catch when your walkthrough <laughs> and it screws it all up. Yeah. And then, and then you realize at the end there are uh, slug targets. So now I got to spend time um, grabbing slugs and putting them in. You know, one, one of the things, uh, for example, is uh, if a stage starts with slug targets and then immediately goes to birdshot. Um, let's say you got uh, six birdshot knockdown steel at your start position, but you have to start with the slug stuff, right? Um, you got two slug targets at 50 yards. 
um, you got six bird shot, you can start with nine in your gun, right? Yeah. So I can put um, two slugs in um, last and then have seven bird shot, which means I can hit each one of my slug targets. And then I got six knockdown steel and it'll give me one left over. And then I can top it off and go do it. But if I'm not competent in my slug shooting, if I miss, uh, when I shoot that last slug, it's going to cycle a bird shot round into the chamber. And then I'm going to have to turn it over and cram two more slugs in or whatever it is. But then I'm going to have to burn and waste that one bird shot that I have in there so I can engage the it's all the math, <laughs> the slug targets, or 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 do I uh, shoot at that shoot at one of the knockdown steals really fast with my my bird shot and then shoot the slugs? But what if it's a slug and then I hit the knockdown steal and it's a that's an automatic match DQ that's not worth it, right? Like it's so I would rather I, I would play that safe, right? If I'm not feeling good about my slug game for whatever reason, right? I'll I'll, I'll maybe put three slugs in, yeah. and then I'll have six bird, but I'll have to shoot. And then, and then of course, what happens is I'll, I'll go one for one on the two slug targets. I've got that extra slug. i got to burn it. And then I've got exactly six bird shot and six targets. Knock those down. Then I go into bolt lock, right? I'm completely empty. The bolt's locked back, and i got to run to my next position. I need to be able to um, get rounds in and chamber around by the time I get to my next stage. And, and so, you know, I, last night, like my most recent Instagram story is me. Uh, I was working on bolt lock reloads and moving to my next position. Yeah. Well, why? Cause shit happens. If you plan your shotgun loading, right. You'll never go into bolt lock. If everything goes perfectly. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't because yeah. we're humans. How many do you do? How many matches do you do? Uh, I, I try to do a, a, a major match a month okay. and a local match a month. Nice. So, I mean, ideally it'd be 24 a year, but some months don't have major matches. So I'll do two locals, right? Yep. That's multi-gun. And then I'll, I'll try to cram in some USPSA pistol matches where I can. Um, but I, I, I get to a range to practice also with live fire once a week. Where do you see yourself going? Like what, what's the, what's the end game for you? Like you're going to try to get to the, like be ranked internationally, like, you know, n- number one internationally, or is it like, what's, I, I don't have, I don't have international aspirations. The, the international, um, scene, Ipsic, uh, it, it's, they've got pistol rat matches, yeah. rifle matches and shotgun matches. They don't have multi-gun. Um, and, uh, multi-guns kind of, it is my sport right now. Yeah. Right. It, it's kind of like, uh, asking a baseball player, like, you have any aspirations to like play on the on the international cricket circuit right like <laughs> if there is such a thing right like right. It, it, that's kind of a bat sort of thing and balls right, right? like it, it's just a different sport yeah. so for example um uh ipsic uh and uspsa pistol uh have a scoring called uh, hit factor so it basically becomes uh points per second so where you hit on a target is um scored and then how quickly you went through a course of fire is considered so it's literally your hit factor is points per second so if if you get all the highest points on every target but it took you forever you're you're gonna have a low hit factor and if you went too fast and maybe didn't get as good a score on your targets uh, that's gonna hurt you too so it's a it's a balancing act between uh speed and accuracy and some people can play the speed game better and other people are better at just throttling it down a little bit and uh, getting their hits, right? right. And, and, and both work. I've seen both win national and international matches. But uh, three guns, slightly different. It's, it's time plus points. Um, it winds up being um, essentially a, a, a race. So if you put two hits anywhere on a paper target or one in the center zone, the A zone, you get um that that target is neutralized if it's a steel target and falls it's neutralized if it's a spinning target and it rotates once it's neutralized then um anything you miss or fail to engage or fail to neutralize uh depending on the type of target type of gun distance all those things you you get penalty seconds added to your raw time okay so um i i like both um, I like switching between 
multiple weapons platforms and having to shift gears like all right now i'm shooting shotgun it's right. totally different than rifle i hold it differently different body mechanics pistols totally different right it's um this last match i shot in vegas the first day every stage they don't necessarily tell you what guns to use you go with what your strength is yeah but the first five stages were all shotgun and rifle every single one of them i didn't shoot a pistol until the end of the second day and i mean i got through it but i hadn't touched my pistol in three days because <laughs> I, I i touched it the day before i left i got them early that morning drove to the range or drove to vegas from here walked stages grabbed dinner went to bed yep got up showed up to the match and we just didn't have any pistol so my it, my pistol almost felt foreign i i went to a, what they call the safety area where you can no ammo is allowed but you can draw your pull your gun out of your holster and uh pointed at a rock and at least get get a few dry fire reps in and okay let's see how this goes yep and and so i i like that uncertainty i like the changing of the platforms it it gives me uh keeps me on my toes i mean it's the same thing same reason i like being a a businessman i i, I like the volatility yeah I, I i need dynamic volatility in order to i don't know feel alive i guess yeah for sure <clears throat> so, so you see yourself like what's the what's the end game for you what do you want to do what do you want to accomplish oh, yeah, what's your what's that. your idea of i guess um everyone has their own definition right of success like oh, okay if i get to this level i'll be successful or whatever it is yeah I, um I, I stopped doing that a long time ago man so what does that mean for you though like what I, is, I, don't, I don't believe in finishing <clears throat> so definition of a success i mean success is a state of mind man I, I, it kind of right. like happiness is a choice right. and you know some days i am just not successful <laughs> not in any sense right. i'm just sucking at life but I, I stopped believing in finish lines a long time ago i, I used to think that way right. you know but it's it it um it's like uh the lie of once i get what i want i'll be happy yeah right yeah. <laughs> i mean just all these experiences just magnify who we are money um it, it, it's it's not a state of having it's it's a state of being I, I i stopped trying to acquire stuff and wanted to have experiences that's that's when i started like really getting back into drumming because i knew that that was that was the last real ex set of experiences that i put continual effort into that that, that had a nice payoff for me yeah. right i wanted to at least start there my wife was into swing dancing and you know we fell in love and that was an experience and then we started having kids but then all of a sudden it's just life right it's it's yeah. not new it just is now and so now uh, we wanted to be with each other but we're still who we are and and so it and and you know the, the day could come that I'll, I'll be really into photography or something probably not that but <laughs> I, I i mean right now these are the experiences that are making me feel like I'm, I'm developing certain perspectives and paradigms that are enriching other areas of my life. I have zero to do with discharging hot lead downrange. Right. Um, and, and, and so I feel like, I, I, I mean, I, I've experienced drastic uh, shifts in my physical well being, my, um, my, spirituality my um mental well-being uh I, I i mean just as i've i've gone through changes in and how i choose to earn money um what i do with my kids what my wife and i choose to do during our our leisure time like we used to like just you know go out to dinner and go see a movie yeah i hate movies now people <laughs> ask me if i've seen x like i used to love live music and I just did so much of it. Like I, I just don't have the desire to go to a concert and stand there for three hours while a bunch of people, you know, granted execute at a grand level performing and feed their egos and fill their pockets. Like it's just not a worthy use of my time. Yeah. I don't like TV. It's really interesting. Um, I really think that my definition of success is not about having, but, 
having nice things, but doing interesting things. Yeah. Um, I, I feel really rich in that uh, I, I'm able to compete in the shooting sports at such a frequent and high level. Yeah. Not to say my, my level of competitiveness relative to my peers is always that high, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I just miss the mark and other times I'm crushing it. And most of the time it's somewhere in between. Right. But it's a spectrum and I'm happy doing it. And I like my friends and my wife and I are having really the time of our lives. It's really interesting because we'll, we'll for the longest time, our neighbors and our, 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 our church congregation and, you know, immediate to slightly extended family were our lives. But now it's like, it's become us and our kids and our friends, like our, our, our shooting friends have become more family than some family members. Yeah. It's interesting as life progresses, people kind of become more isolated and introverted where they're staring at their toes. And we have experienced an exact opposite directionally speaking um shift in our life to where we got more friends and we know what to do with and we're having more fun with and without our kids right and and it's just interesting to come home from the high of a match weekend and then just have a neighbor come over and say hey did you hear about so-and-so he and she or whatever and like just the most petty boring like that yep. and 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 we'll just look at each other after <laughs> holy shit just don't have time for the this. highlight of their life is their neighbor's tragedy or the TV show that they're following right now there that they just binged. Yep. Give me a break. Like I, we live in such amazing times. There's just no reason why we can't get outside of ourselves and go and accomplish amazing stuff. Uh, I went to a, a, a gun store slash shooting range to just get some reps down range uh, last week on a abnormally cold and windy day. Yeah. And and there was this kid that works there. He's going to college, single, yeah. works at a gun range. And I uh, noticed my HK hat or shirt or whatever I was wearing. Um, and he said, whoa, HK fanboy, huh? For those of you that don't know, HK is um, an exceptionally expensive small arms manufacturer, kind of the BMW of, of small arms. Yeah. And uh, so... I said, I, I kind of have to be, I'm on the team, you know, wearing the team colors. <laughs> oh, no way. I've always wanted to try competitive shooting. I just don't have the time. Yeah. You're telling the wrong guy <laughs> that owns several businesses, has employees, four kids. And yeah, you don't have the time. Right. Said that <laughs> the, the 20 something that's the, that works at a gun range. He doesn't have the time. Right. Did you school him up or you just kind of let it go? I just smiled like, I, 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 you know, that's the thing. Like maybe he doesn't. Right. But like, um, I, I did ask him like, yeah, it, it takes some commitment. And he's like, yeah, I just got school right now. And, you know, I'm working two jobs. So, you know, maybe he doesn't have the time. Right. <clears throat> maybe, maybe he works Saturday mornings. And he could never get to a local match. Who knows? Those priorities are just elsewhere right now. He make that's the exactly what it is. But yeah. what I'm saying is for a long time, you know, my wife and I were each other's priority. Not to say that that has changed, but now it's kind of like, well, no shit, you're each other's priority, but what are you doing together? Right. All right. She's my priority. So let's sit on the couch and watch Fallon. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a good point. I, uh, that, that's all my parents want to talk about when I talk. Like, hey, did you see the latest episode or whatever? And I was watching this reality show where these guys came on and they did this really cool thing. Like, no, you don't. I don't watch TV shows about other people doing cool things. Yep. Like I, I grew up in a, in Fairbanks, Alaska, where half the year it it's the outdoors are inhabitable. Right. You you can transition from one heated abode to another, right. but you'll die otherwise, right? Yeah. And so Nintendo and cable TV were what filled my time until I I found a hobby. You know, I'm not another. I don't even like it when people call me a gun nut. Yeah. I'm not a gun nut. People are shocked at how not full my safe is. Right. And I have a big safe. Now, look, I've, I've, I've acquired a, a fair amount of firearms as a sponsored shooter, um, especially the last couple of years. But the guns that I touch all the time, I, 
some people ask me how many guns do you have i say three <laughs> <laughs> obviously yeah, there's more than that but um I, I mean those are the ones that i spend the time with right that and my everyday carry gun and and, and so uh, i'm not interested in collecting safe uh queens as they call them right like huh. I, I'm not interested in collecting collecting guns to just sit in my gun safe and pull out once in a while and tell someone who's visiting about it is probably not interested in it, but no one's looked at it in a while and I need somebody to be amazed by it because I own it. Right. Right. Like I know too many people like that. And there's nothing wrong with being a gun collector. That's just not my interest. Right. I'm not interested in having nice things. I'm interested in doing interesting things. And the second they're not interesting to me anymore or uh I need the money or whatever it's, it's getting sold i don't like things going unused huh. it's eating me alive that i have a very nice drum set sitting in the closet huh. it's probably going on ebay this year what is like, it pearl tama what is it tama star classic babinga shells nice you got the bell brass snare 24 inch kick drums double bass kit a rack i mean it's how much i'll put it on <laughs> we'll uh, promote it right here on the podcast geez uh, i don't even know uh, <laughs> someone was telling me you can get more out of your drum kit if you sell the drums individually than uh, as a kit so yeah. i'll probably hold on to the bell brass snare because those are expensive and harder to find maybe i'll have a kid that wants it but like i you know things i want to pass down to my kids aren't things they're their values their memories. perspectives their memories their experiences like yeah. like your treasures will perish with you right experiences are passing like this whole this whole thing is a passing set of moments so i, I i'm more interested in being present and uh mastering myself i mean i like it man it's good shit i'm gonna ask you a couple questions that i ask everyone that comes on and no uh, problem first one being if you had one book or one person that inspired you the most in your life, whether it be just your life in general, your life as a musician, or your life as a competitive shooter, or your life as a husband or a dad, what would that person be? Or what would that book be? And why? Like the title? Yeah. I mean, like if you have like, like I have a book, you know, that like if I, someone asked me, like, what's your, like the, the book that like kind of puts you on the path that you're on or whatever. I always say the alchemist was like one of the books that I read that I really enjoyed and kind of put me down uh, the path of like figuring myself out. Um, or if, or if there was a person, you know, I'd probably refer to my my high school football coach. You know, super influential and very inspirational to me. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I can think of some books. <laughs> uh, There's not one that sticks out to you, or one person that was like the mo- the biggest influence in your life. Well, a person is different than a book. Well, that's what I'm saying. A person or a book or both doesn't matter. Uh probably the person that really, really drove a lot of things home that I'd picked up from books, right? Yeah. I, uh, probably Gary Vaynerchuk. Oh yeah. He's, uh, you know who he is? Oh yeah, totally. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I was, I was lucky enough to contribute to, uh, his l- previous to his current, uh, bestseller book, uh, ask Gary V. So I, I contributed a question for one of the chapters. Yeah. And uh, he asked me to to read uh, a few of the questions in his audio version of the book. Oh, nice! So, um, found his podcast when he was just getting it started. It was big, but not that big um, to where he's inaccessible like he is now. Yep. Um, I, I I flew myself out to New York to uh, participate in the little party that he's putting around the hundredth episode of the Ask Gary V podcast, which. I don't even listen to anymore. I don't have time. I don't have time to consume much other content. I'm too busy either making content. And making your own content. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm out having my own experiences. I just happen to use cameras to make content so yeah. other people can join me on the journey. But um, I mean, he, yeah, he, having spent time with him, he's one of the most genuine people out there. And uh, I, I love his, uh, the fact that he just doesn't care about stuff. He cares about the experiences, huh. you know, other people have driven that home to, to where I, I, I could think about it and I intellectually understood it, but I was still wanting things right for a while. I mean, I've had a lot of nice cars yep. when business has been good. Porsches, Mercedes, BMWs. Uh, I could not care less about cars. Right. I, I, I <laughs> when I got into the shooting sports, I got rid of my BMW five series and, and picked up Dodge Challenger. And uh, like, I I went from 
driving a car that was $60,000 that no one looked twice at because everyone else in the area I live in has something similar. It's just status quo to driving something that I got used for under $10,000, but looked sporty. And I'll tell you, if, if I ever wanted to start picking up uh, middle-aged, balding, uh, overweight dudes at gas stations, that was the car. <laughs> I'd have more dudes come up and talk to me. Right. And uh, that, that, that really cracked uh, that perspective wide open. Um, like this is ridiculous. Yeah. And, but I was, I wasn't going to drive a, a BMW down all the dirt roads I was going to, to get to shooting ranges and matches and, right. you know, uh, something like that. It looked cool, but I didn't care about dents and scratches, fragmentation from random rounds. Like it just, it's just part of the game. Yeah. Um, I've since moved on from that vehicle, but you know, Toyota truck's not exactly a, a head turn. Yeah. I like it, but I, I, I don't, I don't love vehicles anymore. It, you know, it's it's just I think it's a maturity or a no because people that like cars aren't immature. Uh, it, it's for me. You I think I different things. I like them. I think for the wrong reasons. Right. I found other things that I valued more that I didn't know existed. Yeah, I didn't realize how amazing experiences were. Right, and uh, relationships, the people in my life. Yep. Um, the people that I was doing business with for a long time uh, that granted rewarded me financially well, that gave me things, weren't people that I would spend time with right. if the money right. wasn't there. Yeah, It, it was a uh, compromise. I don't like compromising anymore for certain things. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I took my marketing agency and shut it down and now it's just a boutique consulting firm. So I have more time. I charge the clients I work with more money. And I like every single client I work with. If there's a client I don't like, I fire them. I, I just, <laughs> life's too short. Every day is too damn short now to where totally. I, so um, Gary, Gary's probably the one that sticks out the most. I like that, man. I love Gary V. A lot of good shit, man. I love his content. Um, so the uh, second question is, if you had one lesson that you learned in life, um, and maybe that was it right now. You just think as I was part of it, not part of your answer, the first one, but, um, one lesson that you learned in life that you wish somebody would have taught you when you were younger and said like, Hey man, like, and so you had to go through this heartache. You had to go through, you know, wh whatever be a horrible business decision or, you know, relationship decision or whatever life decision. And, uh, you can impart that knowledge on somebody else that's coming up in the world. Uh, so they don't have to experience the same heartache. What would that lesson be and why? Oh, without question. Uh, people are the only real assets, right? So I, the, the first example I like to use is gold. Dinosaurs weren't fighting over gold digging, you know, like there's no value to gold for dinosaurs, right? right. Um, uh, the second lesson or illustration I do when I'm, I'm talking to my kids about this is, uh, um, the, uh, a can of Coke and a dollar. So if you got a can of Coke and I got a dollar and you sell it to me, how much, this is a question, not just rhetorical, how much is that Coke worth? Whatever I was willing to pay for it. Right, but right. in that transaction. A dollar. No. See, a dollar is the only wrong answer. And here's why. Um, I wanted the Coke more than the dollar. So to me, the Coke was worth more than a dollar. Got it. Right? And it's the exact inverse with you. You would rather have the dollar than the Coke. So the Coke uh, was, was uh, worth less than the dollar. Huh. Okay. So um, we're two humans experiencing a moment together, but from very, very different, in fact, diametrically opposed um, filters and paradigms, right? Yep. Um, a transaction just happened and then you're going to go about your day and I'm going to go about my day. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, a, a dollar is a metric through which value is uh, um, measured, but it is far from accurate. Money is not math yep. at all. We use math to illustrate a lot of things about money, but we're, 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 we're quantifying a, a qualitative experience between two humans, yep. right? Uh, it's fascinating to me. And, and so, you know, outside of business and economics, <laughs> I don't work with a company as a competitive shooter that uh, 
is not filled with people that have the same values I do and uh, I can't be friends with. Literally everyone at Vortex Optics I, I talk to and work with is a friend. Um, people view HK as this cold, hard German <laughs> corporate entity, but all the people at HK that I work with are very close. Yep. I mean, we have dinner together several times a year and I talk to them on the phone and like they care, they're, they're friends. Yep. Um, same with Breda shotguns, same with, uh, as of, as of April this year, uh, Alicia and I are both shooting for, uh, federal ammunitions three gun team. Nice. Um, the people over at federal, I, I, I mean, I met them at shot show. Uh, the, the Sunday night before the whole show started and we were, we were just meeting up with some friends and she brought some friends and they happened to be with federal. And like, it, it was just something that happened after we became friends. Hey, we'd really like to have you guys. Can, can you come by the booth? We're really busy the next couple of days. We'll try like who wouldn't in my world. An ammo sponsorship is the Holy grail. Is it really, especially in three gun, you know, usually yeah. someone will have like a pistol ammo sponsor yeah. or some, or a company that makes pistol and rifle a pistol rifle and shotgun. Most three gunners are sponsored by uh, pistol and rifle companies right. uh, if they have an ammo sponsor, but they're, they're still buying their shotgun shells, right? right. Um, it, it's a rare, beautiful thing, but it was all about the relationship. I wasn't trying to schmooze. I wasn't sending out resumes. I wasn't, I wasn't hustling, mostly because I wasn't looking for it yeah. at the time. But I, I mean, those, <laughs> so they, they saw the value and then they see like, I, I want to say that, that I'm sponsored by these companies because I'm such a badass shooter. I'm so good that they want to see me winning with their shit, yeah. right? But that's not what's happening. Yeah. People relate to Alicia and I, my wife, um, because we're normal people with a family and we we seem accessible. Right. We just happen to compete in this exotic action sport that not a lot of people know much about, but they've heard of. Yep. Really? You do three gun? Wow. Seeing her run a 12 gauge, 110 pound girl can run a 12 gauge. It's all about body mechanics, not weight or height, right. but no one knows that unless you're in it and doing it. It's, it's a practitioner thing. And so the value uh, of these human relationships, uh, as soon as I, I've, you only see bad stuff happen when people start valuing things over people. When you start, right. when you start defining a group of people as bad, like we see politicians doing all the time. Oh yeah. When you sit down and meet with individuals, very rarely do you think that is that is one bad piece of crap, you know, 10 pounds of crap stuffed into a five pound bag kind of thing. Right. Most people want the same general things. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that have been anti-gun, but since they talked to me about the competitive shooting sports, it, it's just a an activity that tests marksmanship and athleticism. I get it now. Like you're the first gun owners I've ever met that are just normal people. Like, have you met any others? Like, right. do, you, do you have like some FUD prepper friend that like wears camo pants, uh, you know, this all seven days of the week and buries tr- gold in the backyard and is waiting <laughs> for the zombie apocalypse to happen the week before right. Jesus returns? Like, I, cause, and it, it's unfortunate. Like I, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't like the, the arguments and the comments that I get on, on social media. Like, that's right, Sean. We, we got to keep fighting against those liberals. I, I hate to tell you, but I'm, I'm a liberal. Right. I'm a classical liberal. I believe in liberty and freedom. Yeah. Uh, but most people don't use that word to define that. Right. 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 So. And it's funny because people don't, they, they think that one can exist with the other. So it's like, you know, you're, you're a liberal. So therefore, if you're a liberal, then you want to get rid of all these. I mean, that's kind of the that's the dialogue that's happening in this country right now, you know, where it's like, if you're a conservative, then you just want to get rid of all the liberals. If you're a liberal, you want to get rid of all the conservatives and you want to silence the other side. And it, it happens on both, on both ends. And it's, it's kind of silly. I, I had just gotten I done. like to challenge my own beliefs, you know? So it's like, if I, if I want to call myself a conservative, who am I to just not ever even want to hear the other side? Right? See, I'm not a conservative. Like right. I'm, I'm, I'm fiscally conservative, right? Socially liberal. Yeah. As long as it doesn't, uh, require money out of my pocket <laughs> right you, you know <laughs> right. uh, thomas jefferson said if it uh <laughs> if it's not breaking my leg or picking my pocket what business is it of mine right that's pretty damn close to my belief system leave yeah. me alone i'll leave you alone if you want to be friends 
cool. Let's talk. Let's understand each other. But I'm not going to walk on your lawn and tell you how to, how to live. I'm not going to tell you what church you should go to. I'm not telling you. <laughs> and, and it's, it's really, really funny because here in, in Utah, there's, there's a lot of people that really think they, they have it figured out how everyone should live their lives and think. And um, I, I have a problem with that. But the root of my own spirituality is, is uh, derived from Mormonism too. So, but I, I, I don't fit in with this Mormon culture. It, it, it doesn't work for me because I, there, there's, there's too rich of a spectrum in the human experience and existence that like, I have all sorts of friends from all sorts of walks of life. And I would never dream of trying to exclude them from my life because of a difference. I, I, I need that difference. I need that spectrum to pull totally. from. I hate it. I hate being around people that think the same way as me huh. in a lot of ways. And I'll, I'll never forget last year when I was teaching one of those uh, groups of um, gay men <clears throat> in another state. And then I went to San Francisco on business and, you know, I, I made some comment like, man, I, you know, I really, I really like this area. I wish I could carry. Um, and somebody made a um, derogatory comment to the effect of like, yeah, those fag liberals. Yeah. You know, just like, <laughs> I like, 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 first of all, I, I, I didn't know a bundle of sticks had, had uh, political leanings uh, or a British cigarette, whatever, you know. And I, I just like, Sexual orientation has has nothing to do with the fact that that Second Amendment um, rights are not protected out there. Um, it's you know the the, the left leaning uh, politics for sure. But like, what what good does that do? What does that accomplish? How how does that make your human experience better? How I, I mean, like, let let's go fight for rights. But in that, like, the very idea of categorizing and classifying a whole group of humans based off of how you view your opposition to how you think they exist um, shows a lack of understanding and it shows a desire to exert force on them, which is completely anti-liberty <laughs> to begin with. Totally. Like, I, I just, I actually believe in liberty. Yeah. And it's a foreign concept to many, many, many conservatives. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, I responded as much, you know, in a, a shorter comment and it just turned into a big, big, uh, comment thread, uh, argument on one of my posts. And I just let everyone that was involved and interested in it, hash it out. It boosted my algorithm and then I posted something else. Uh, and I got a lot more views than I normally would have. So yeah, I, so uh, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll stand up for for things, but at a certain point, I, I can't spend all day arguing about uh, cat memes and uh, political ideologies where it has little effect. I, I'd rather sit across from someone like this and have a real conversation. And the, I, I, I can show you DMs in my phone, people that say like, "I didn't believe in guns until I met you." Right. I assure you, guns exist. Yeah. Right. The, the, sorry, but I, the only real value is in human beings. As soon as we value ideas and things more than the actual people, I mean, never let a task to be performed become more important than a person to be loved, ever. Yep. Um, when we keep that perspective, a lot more gets accomplished. I like it, man. It's a super, that's a good, that's a great takeaway, man. Great way to, to end the podcast too, man. That's a it's good been one. A, been a pretty uh, multi <clears throat> multifaceted conversation definitely man and i uh i genuinely appreciate you man coming uh or being willing to come on the podcast and share your story and um you know taking the time out of your day to do it so i appreciate it and i definitely look forward to hopefully training with you one day you know because i know i have a uh, any time i know you have limited time this weekend and I yeah certainly do too but yeah, i'm flying out, out tonight but i'll be i'll be back out here man for sure okay um, I'll be doing some rock climbing and whatnot out here. Never rock climbed before, so I'm going to learn. I got someone you need to interview. He's a professional rock climber and a three gunner. I'm down. I'm always down, man. That's the one thing I, I, or one of the many things I love about podcasting is like the organic growth. That's like you podcast with one person, like, hey, I have a guy you might want to talk to, talk to them. And it's like, there's really no, um, 
when I started the whole thing, it wasn't really like, oh, I want to stick to this niche or I want to stick to this this demographic. No, I, I'll talk to anybody. I mean, I talked to a medium the other day. You know, I talked wow. to, you know, so it's like it, it goes across all walks of life, man. And because uh, I think there's many takeaways from many different people, so why not interview a bunch of people? Um, but anyway, man, I really, uh, I really appreciate you. So uh, look forward to hanging out again, man. A pleasure. Thanks right, for having brother. me on. All right, lady. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.